Hi, I'm Jeffrey Turnbull. I'm the Director of Innovation with KPMB Architects here in Toronto, Ontario. Before we get into the interview itself, why don't you tell me a little bit about KPMB Architects? What do you do? And I would say, as it pertains to the future of work, what is your thesis? So KPMB Architects is a, is a leading architecture firm here in Canada. Uh, we've been around for about 30 years uh, and we've, we do a lot of work uh, here in Toronto, across Canada and the United States. Um, <clears throat> a lot of our work is in the institutional space where we do work uh, on university campuses with University of Toronto, uh, you know, lots of American Ivy League schools, that kind of thing. We do uh, lots of work in museums, concert halls. Uh, we do a lot of uh, office space as well, commercial office space. Uh, and we do have a side of the office that does uh, residential, sort of high rise residential work as well. Um, in terms of the future of work, I think our thesis is largely uh, focused on sustainable building, addressing climate change. You know, that's, that's the issue of the day. Buildings as a as a industry have a lot to do with that, contribute a lot to the problem, and so we're kind of laser focused on addressing that issue, addressing greenhouse gas emissions in our projects, and really trying to get to a new status quo of of building. What is the link between buildings and the future of work? Usually, the conversations are around, you know, skills around uh, in the current environment. Of course, remote working, but also learning. Um, help me understand the connection with buildings. I think there's an obvious connection in terms of uh, the people who actually build the buildings. Um, there's a there's a large, you know, thousands of people are required to actually produce a building. Uh, and so when we're talking about next generation projects. We're talking about requiring another level up in the skill set required to actually deliver that project. Uh, and so we've been involved in a number of research projects <clears throat> looking at where are the deficiencies in the market in terms of skilled trades. Uh, and corporations that have the ability to kind of deliver the products that we're designing. On our end of things, um, I think there's a there's an educational onus where we need to uh, expand the topics that we consider when we design a project, um, and and that really means expanding the the aspects that we consider in design. So there's an educational imperative there as well. This is a pretty interesting time. Nobody's really quite sure what's going to happen, you know, in terms of. Are we still going to have cities? Do we still like cities? Is that a thing? I think the answer there is yes, absolutely. But uh, it's definitely a, an interesting time. I think the, the the kind of overlapping or colliding phenomenon of the accelerating pace of climate change and what that means, what we need to do to the building stock that exists today to address that, as well as new projects going forward, combined with, you know, here in Canada, uh, we have a lot of immigration. Toronto is a rapidly growing city. That's positive for us and for our economy, but we need to be growing in a way that's climate positive and not negative. And so there's these kind of competing forces. You layer on a pandemic and sort of financial uncertainty. It's There's a lot happening in the space, for sure. Absolutely. And I'll see, if I bring you a bit towards the, the actual, uh, let's say, crux of this series and this interview we're, we're producing on uh, the future of work and in particular on intrapreneurship, um, yeah. What does that mean to you? What is an intrapreneur and what is the relationship or the dynamic between intrapreneurship and innovation? I cheated and I looked up what an intrapreneur is and the internet says that an intrapreneur is someone who's self-motivated, they're proactive, they're action-oriented, they display leadership skills and they think outside the box. And I think, you know, all of that resonates with me. I would agree with all of that. And I might extend that list by adding on, you know, somebody possessed of curiosity uh, having a, maybe a dissatisfaction with the status quo, uh, desire to find a better way to do things, um, be good to get excited by creating value in the process. I like your definition. I like uh, how you've upgraded it. So what, what do you think are some of the skills? You've sort of talked about some of the innate uh, you know, characteristics like curiosity, uh, but uh, what, what are the skills that an intrapreneur has to possess and how can Canada instill these skills or even this mindset uh, in our in our future workforce? When I think about that as a question, the thing that really stands out uh, in my mind is the ability to see issues from multiple perspectives and consequently identify opportunities <coughs> that you might not see from a mono perspective. Um, I recently read a book called Range, Why Generalists Triumph in a Specialized World by David Epstein. I'm not sure if you're familiar, but he makes the case that there's a whole set of activities where having a very background and skill set give an individual an advantage over somebody else with a more narrowly constrained or you know a specific skill set. I think entrepreneurship is definitely one of those kinds of activities. So 
the question of you know how would we encourage that i think i think education is really key maintaining a kind of a commitment to a broad spectrum curriculum that's you know strong in stem subjects because that's important but also pays attention to art history music physical education life skills etc to kind of make that broad foundation that that becomes the basis for critical thinking skills later on um, i think is really super important Within an organization, uh, what are some of the benefits in terms of the capacity to innovate, to uh, commercialize, which we know is super important in Canada, in fact, a real challenge for us as a country? Um, and also, are there any sort of risks or disadvantages to having intrapreneurs within an organization? You know, I think that innovation is an essential ingredient for entrepreneurship and indeed a, a desire to harness innovation or have your organization be innovative is the motivating principle for engaging with an entrepreneurship model. <clears throat> so I'm, you know, I'm as fond or nostalgic as the next person about, you know, last century's kind of large industrial concern with the skunk works model of, of entrepreneurship. It's very romantic, but I think we have a contemporary idea of what this is and it comes, <clears throat> I think it's influenced a lot by Clayton Christensen's book, The Innovator's Dilemma, and I'm, I'm sure you're familiar. The word disruption is, uh, you know, almost meaningless at this point because it's so overused, but he was using it in a very specific way to describe this function within a model of industries with large incumbent uh, players who lose market share progressively and end up being overtaken completely over time by these new entrants who come into the business with some kind of a technological innovation or an evolution. And I think when he published that, uh, certainly people who are managers in these large incumbent industries are interested in not being disrupted in that way and trying to harness that kind of innovative uh, capacity within the own organization so that they can live through multiple cycles of the, you know, the, the business cycle in their industry. I think the form that entrepreneurship takes varies by industry. So I'm an architect, I work with architects. If you ask architects what they do, they'll tell you that they make buildings. But in a conversation like this, uh, it might be more useful to say, we're in the professional services consulting business. As such, we're perpetually in a slow motion race against the commodification of the services that we offer. Our challenge, plainly put, is to continue to develop new and valuable service offerings for our clients. There's an opportunity there, if we can get out in front of that, we can proactively identify the kinds of issues and challenges that we want to engage with and map that onto some understanding of who we are as a firm and what our core competencies are. We can really guide the evolution of the firm, the development of the firm. So at KPMB, we found something called the KPMB Lab, and the purpose of it is exactly that, to you know, provide that, that role. I think the value of entrepreneurship comes from that ability to continue to grow and evolve as a business and, and remain relevant. And so I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's existential in, in most businesses. I would struggle to think of a business in which that isn't you know, a primary preoccupation. Um, there are definitely risks associated with it. Uh, I think you know, a big one is it costs money. Um, we're spending money on research and development, and it's possible to do that in a way that you don't see a return from. And so that's, you know, that's a risk. I think the other big risk is that if you don't do it, somebody else is going to do it. You will be the you know the disrupted uh, incumbent, and so I, I think that's a I think that's a huge risk. And sort of understanding a balance between the two is important. To me, it sounds like entrepreneurship, surely like entrepreneurship, uh, is is also a culture. What are some of the priorities and actionable priorities um, uh, that we need to focus on to 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 evolve our culture to become more entrepreneurial? From my perspective as an architect, working to advance innovation in the building sector, I think the biggest thing we could do in Canada as a group is to use our collective purchasing power to create a market for innovation, um, which I think speaks to the notion of commercialization that, that you brought up. The building industry is notoriously resistant to innovation, but here in Canada, I think we have all the ingredients to really take a leadership position on innovation in that industry globally. We have abundant natural resources, we have a developed manufacturing sector, we have world-class professional and technical skills, schools, we have large base of skilled trades that are not evenly distributed across the country, but we have them. We have a growing population that needs new buildings, we have strong technical and computing infrastructure. <clears throat> All the ingredients are there. In terms of procuring buildings in Canada, governments are major clients in the, in the building industry. And there are, there are some interesting things happening uh, in various levels of government. The federal government has 
uh, green and government uh, strategy coming out of the Treasury Secretariat, which I think is an excellent program and has the potential to really make an impact. At the municipal level, there's some progressive jurisdictions are enacting regulations that I think are going to push things ahead quite a bit. In Vancouver, notably, Toronto is the green standard as well. Most of the tax dollars, though, most of the public money that goes into buildings is happening at the provincial level, both through the departments of the provincial governments themselves, as well as the broader public sector that they you know, participate and fund. Um, and the trend in procurement at that level has been pretty negative for a generation now, I'm going to say. Uh, what we're seeing is a lot of work being procured through quite onerous competition type arrangements, uh, where the proponents and the competitions have to essentially work for free for months on end to have a chance at winning work. <clears throat> and then when, if and when work is awarded, we often see language that might have been included in the original RFP documents talking about, you know, a desire for innovative solutions and sustainability and so on being set aside uh, in favor of the proponent team that's promising the lowest cost. So I think what that really creates is a situation in the marketplace where only the most entrenched players can even ante in to, to get into the competition in the first place. And when they do, the process is so expensive and we're so used to seeing the lowest common denominator being, being selected um, that the behavior, the rational behavior is to be as conservative as possible. And essentially, I think it, it creates an environment that's kind of the exact opposite of the environment that you would want if you're trying to encourage innovation and entrepreneurship. So I think there's an opportunity to turn that situation entirely on its head. <clears throat> and instead of operating in a race to the bottom kind of mode, we could look at this large pool of projects that's being procured, which represents a, a massive spend of public money, and recognize the opportunity to leverage those projects as the generator of industry-wide innovation. Instead of asking, how cheap can we make it? We could adopt an export-oriented mindset <laughs> and ask, how much value for Canada as a nation could we generate by leveraging these products, projects to produce this kind of activity in the industry? The development of the projects can be the test lab for the kind of innovations that the industry needs. The construction of the buildings is the proof of concept that's required in the on-the-job training that gets those innovations to market. And this is how we create a, you know, a globally leading export-oriented innovative building sector. My final question is is a sort of an, a pitch. Uh, if you had, you know, uh, leaders in front of you or a leader, a lot of people like to pitch the prime minister um, to and your pitch was about how to cultivate this culture of entrepreneurship in Canada. Who would you choose to pitch and what would you say in 30 seconds or less? I think as an architect, I would I would elect to pitch to the collected provincial premiers and urge them to recognize the opportunity inherent in procurement of buildings across the departments we adopt this export-oriented mindset and endeavor to create world-leading buildings industry, then the billions of dollars that we spend every year on buildings could be a catalyst to make that transformation happen.